It's that time of the year! Halloween special! And stuff. But this time with even more signs than ever before. And it just so happens that I have a perfect topic for Halloween. The penultimate topic, if you will. It's about Dracula, as you can probably tell from the title of the video. More officially, known as Vlad the Impaler, or Vlad Tepes in Romanian. And that's because of his reputation for basically impaling people on wooden stakes, especially if they crossed him or if they disobeyed him directly. But more specifically, we're going to be discussing some of the extremely recent discoveries about the actual person of Vlad the Impaler, because in a recent paper, scientists were able to use some of the papers that he used to write on to basically analyze his DNA, discovering that he actually had an unusual disorder that potentially made him cry blood, adding to the already mysterious persona that he had back in the days. And so let's discuss Vlad Dracula a little bit more from a historical perspective, find out how he got the reputation he has today, and talk about these recent discoveries. But first, I guess, the obvious. A lot of the reputation he acquired back in the days was really because of the time and the place where he was one of the rulers. His father, Vlad Dracul, was the ruler of a small kingdom of Wallachia. Today it's part of Romania, but back then this was a kingdom that was essentially bordering the growing and developing Ottoman Empire. Around this time, the empire was focusing mostly on expanding northwest and was basically conquering one European kingdom at a time. But Wallachia resisted, and so in order to basically make them a vassal and to avoid further confrontation, Prince Vlad, along with his brother, for many years were held as hostages in the Ottoman Empire in order to secure their father's loyalty. And the entire region during this time experienced constant warfare from various factions trying to control the land. At some point, Vlad was actually able to become the ruler, which did involve crossing a few people here and there, but what made his strategy a little bit different is that he decided to use fear as the weapon. During a conflict with nearby Transylvanian Saxons, he plundered some of the villages, taking a lot of prisoners back to Wallachia, where he essentially had all of them impaled afterwards in order to kind of demonstrate what happens if someone crosses him. And it was so effective that he basically started doing this everywhere. But at this point, the Ottoman Empire was growing larger and larger. Here's actually what it looked like within just 80 years. And because of this expansion, they were essentially trying to make sure Wallachia either becomes part of the empire or at least pays annual tribute. And so one of the Ottoman sultans, Mehmed II, ordered Vlad to start paying tribute around the year 1462. But instead, he captured the Ottoman envoys, had them impaled, and then attacked Ottoman territory nearby further impaling thousands of people. And this really solidified his reputation as Vlad the Impaler. Apparently he might have impaled up to 80,000 people during his reign, but the reign itself ended pretty quickly as soon as Ottoman Empire decided to strike back. And so in 1463 he was captured and held in captivity for approximately 12 years. And two things happened during this time. First, some of the first stories about his cruelty started to come out in a lot of different European countries, mostly because he was seen as a kind of a protector of Christian faith and was pretty successful fighting the Ottoman Empire. And second, near the end of his captivity, he also started to write himself with some of the letters still preserved today. This one was written in 1475. And even though he was released in 1475, he didn't survive long and perished two years later. But at this point, various stories about how cruel he was and how he basically reigned with fear started to spread everywhere, making their way to western countries where something else happened around the same time. In 1400s, in Germany, Johannes Gutenberg invented his famous press. And it just so happens that one of the first bestsellers in Europe printed in these new presses was basically about Vlad the Impaler. At this point it was bigger than the Bible and probably one of the most read stories in most of the western European countries. And today it's actually believed that it became so popular because of the cover. This was literally on the cover of the book and was extremely different from anything else at this time. It presented a ruler who was dining in a field surrounded by impaled bodies, representing a horrific scene never before seen in any books previously. This particular image is from the edition published in 1499 in Nuremberg. Here's how he was portrayed in some of these German books, with most of the book dedicated to his cruelty. But naturally, he lost the war, the Ottoman Empire reached its peak approximately 80 years later, and then shifted its attention to North Africa. 
And so despite these early publications and, I guess, early success, this viral sensation eventually got replaced by other stories and he was, to some extent, forgotten for some time. And that's, of course, until Bram Stoker started to do research for his novel Dracula. And he actually wanted to find some kind of a historical connection to various Transylvanian superstitions involving vampirism. He found out about these superstitions by reading articles by Emily Gerard, who essentially described various Transylvanian practices, including the fear of unusual creatures that were believed to suck blood. These stories might have inspired a lot of other artists, including Edward Monk, who literally has this painting called Vampire, and this was painted before Dracula came out. There are actually quite a few vampire paintings around this time, so this clearly was a very popular topic in the late 1800s. And during his research, Bram Stoker somehow discovered the stories about Vlad the Impaler, eventually turning this into one of the most famous horror books of all times. Although today historians believe he might have not actually done a lot of very thorough research, because first of all, in the book, there doesn't seem to be a lot of reference to the actual Vlad the Impaler, with a lot of other references, kind of confusing various regions various belief systems, and more importantly, making them the leader of Transylvania, even though he was technically the leader of the region they were at war with. Transylvanians were some of the first victims of his impaling, and Wallachia was an entirely different region. Nevertheless, this was technically the birth of Count Dracula and the birth of vampires as a phenomenon. But it really wasn't until 2023, or basically just a few months ago from when I'm making this video, that scientists finally discovered something else about Vlad the Impaler that nobody actually ever mentioned or knew before. And it's not entirely clear what this means just yet. And in this case, this was done using a very intriguing technique, involving handwritten letters by Vlad Tapis himself. And here the point is that when we write by hand, it's quite common for the person doing the writing to place their palm on the paper, making the palm rest and rub on the paper as you write. And turns out that this actually transfers quite a lot of organic molecules from your palm down into the paper, which can then be preserved inside the paper for a very long time. And so knowing this, this is kind of what the researchers behind the paper in the description wanted to explore. By applying and removing ethylene vinyl acetate, and by then using mass spectrometry, they discovered residues of over 500 different peptides, with 100 being of human origin. Peptides are basically very short chains of amino acids, very often containing parts of proteins, which can then be used in genetic analysis. And by then conducting the analysis of these proteins and peptides from three separate letters written by Dracula that all contain these proteins, they were able to discover something really unusual. First, they discovered signs of what's known as celiopathy, a genetic disorder that often creates problems for various cells and for various organs. There's no one disorder that it can cause, but there are a lot of different syndromes and potential disorders that can be caused by celiopathy long term. It's not clear if this manifested in him, but it very likely did. They also found evidence of some kind of an inflammatory disease, potentially resulting in major problems with his skin and respiratory tract. In other words, he potentially had a major skin problem, along with maybe some kind of asthma. But more intriguingly was the discovery of compounds very often linked to what's known as hemolacria an unusual condition that tends to mix blood with various fluids inside tear ducts, literally resulting in tears of blood. And that by itself makes this whole story oh so halloween -y. I mean, if this is true, then this is a completely new level of Dracula we never knew about. Now, obviously none of this is mentioned in any of the chronicles about him, and I'm sure anyone who possibly even wanted to mention it ended up on a stake, but if this is actually confirmed, it definitely makes Dracula an even more intriguing person, more mysterious, and more scientifically intriguing compared to anything we knew about him before. And so, if these studies are correct, for all we know, Count Dracula, or Vlad III, Vlad Tapis, Vlad the Impaler, might have been asthmatic, had some kind of a skin problem, potentially cried tears of blood, and might have had some other disorders manifested through celiopathy, which back then would definitely make him some kind of a unusual character. Some of these somewhat rare, mysterious disorders would definitely make him a somewhat unnerving person to be around. Unless I guess he never cried. Which maybe he didn't. But anyway, definitely some really intriguing discoveries just based on these three letters and something you can learn more about by reading the study in the description below. And hopefully this research leads somewhere else because we might discover something else for next Halloween. So I get to talk about that as well. 
But until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, check out some of the previous videos on similar topics in the description below, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Happy Halloween! Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.